thunder. Well, the internet is thinking over here, apparently. Interesting. Oh. Well, that's not good. It says that it is not working. <laughs> uh, let's just see. One more time. If it will work. Because this is definitely the info they sent me. Oh, see now I did it to all of us. Okay, um, well, this is a problem because it says that our streaming stuff does not work. And that is what they had sent me. Okay. Can you stop sharing here? Sure, I'm gonna have to reach out to Aaron because they're gonna have to send me new info. Because... Now the dogs start. Okay. Okay. Let's just. I don't know if you guys seen what Aaron had put in there. I did not. You just said, don't forget to mute and stream. Oh, 
Yes. Hey, Jen. Yep, it's new, and so you can stream away. It's viewing. The session starts at noon. Oh, it won't. It on my end, it said it that wasn't working. So, oh, are you able to stream? No, I I'm not able to stream. So, I am re putting in the information off of the form just to make sure that there Perfect. wasn't something incorrect. And I am copying the last thing. Perfect. Right this minute. So, okay. that is actually what is going awesome. on over here. Okay, great. So, Let me know if I can help. All right, give us two seconds because I'm going to redo this um, to see if it works. And then I will. Yeah, it before I just kept uh, stopping. It was like, yeah, I just copied it off the form and it just keeps stalling. Jen, let me put them into the chat here for you. Okay. And then you yeah. Let me try that. Yeah, because I got them off of the spreadsheet. Give me a minute. Yeah. Into... Okay. <laughs> First one is this. Second one is this. Third one is this. Does that help? Can you grab those? I'm doing it right now. Saving it and let's try this again. Hope that the third time is the charm. <laughs> Something just showed up as live. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. I have no idea what was going on, but. All right. You guys got me? Yep. And I just, it looks like. Perfect. We're going so uh, we can get started here. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, welcome back everybody uh, to the session on climate and charismatic water birds. Our next, next speaker is Taylor Finger and Taylor is the migratory game bird ecologist for the Wisconsin DNR. Today he's going to be talking to us about variation um, in weather and climate and how it's impacting Wisconsin's waterfowl. And just a reminder, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A question um, <clears throat> section and we will answer those when Taylor's uh, done here. So with that, thanks for coming today, Taylor, and, and we look forward to um, hearing your talk. Hey, well, thanks for having me. Uh, well, after some technical difficulties, uh, we pulled through here. Uh, I, again, appreciate uh, the folks at Stevens Point having me in for this. I, I think this is, uh, is a good talk and should uh, have some discussion afterwards. So I'm going to be going over, you know, just basic waterfowl and wetland conditions here in Wisconsin, what some of our main species are and what uh, their populations are as it relates here in Wisconsin to continentally and then how uh, water is impacting um, um, our birds in particular, as well as what our birds are at continentally and some of the threats that they're facing. So just uh, trying to advance here. There we go. So just uh, to go over, um, as a reminder, these birds are migratory and Wisconsin is pretty near the top of the migratory flyway. 
So although some of these birds we have in state and actually nest in state, quite a few of our birds that we see come through Wisconsin are just migrating through. So Wisconsin puddle ducks or puddle ducks that we see here in Wisconsin also considered dabblers because uh, they forage on you know aquatic invertebrates, um, aquatic vegetation, and then sometimes grain when they can get it. So for example, we have mallards on the top left. The top central is gadwall, top right is blue winged teal, bottom left is shovelers, uh, bottom central wood ducks, and bottom right is green winged teal. Again, these are species that we consider puddle ducks because the habitat that they uh, tend to take advantage of are much more shallower wetlands where they can, rather than having to dive down and acquire aquatic in, uh, invertebrates or aquatic vegetation, they tend to at least leave part of their body above the water. So again, that's why they're considered dabblers. Um, for diving ducks, we have a slew of diving ducks and sea ducks here in Wisconsin. We only have really one or two that nest here in Wisconsin, golden eyes, and you might see some buffalo head or some redheads here in Wisconsin. But we do see huge numbers that migrate through Wisconsin on the Mississippi River and Green Bay and Lake Michigan. So again, for example, here, the top left is uh, le uh, lesser scop, uh, top central bufflehead, top right is golden eye, bottom left is redhead, bottom central is long tail ducks, and bottom right are canvasbacks. And just to put it into perspective, of the nearly half a million canvasbacks continentally, we may see two to 300,000 on the Mississippi River at any point in time during the fall. So we have one of the largest staging grounds of the entire population for canvasbacks on the river. Similarly, on the east side of the state, uh, Green Bay, uh, we see huge numbers, uh, tens of thousands of scop and golden eye uh, on, on there as well. So we, we've seen this massive increase in diving ducks and sea ducks overwintering on the Great Lakes um, because although aquatic invasive mussels are not great for everyone, they're an unlimited food resource for a lot of these birds. They're not a great food resource, but it's unlimited and we see these birds taking advantage of it. So some of the threats to Wisconsin's waterfowl, uh, and again, I'll touch base a little bit on it, is we have you know continued loss and degradation of wetlands, whether that's uh, getting out there and draining these wetlands so we can put agriculture on the landscape or you know converting some of that, uh, what was rural habitat into more urban sprawl. Um, same thing with continued loss of grassland habitat wherever we can we've continually seen whatever was traditionally grassland if we can make it into agriculture uh we, we tend to lose that high quality grassland habitat which these birds require for nesting uh, for most of these birds additionally we've seen these huge variations in water fluctuation that i'll touch base later on in the presentation that uh have potential huge impacts on these on these birds you know for example if we see these massive floodings that occur during the springtime, you know, we can see nests that are wiped out. Um, and then if those birds don't have enough time to re-nest, that's an entire lost nesting period. And then our recruitment tends to go down. And then if we have really, we have good conditions in the springtime, all of a sudden we, we've had no rain. And that's what we've been seeing the last couple of years is that we've been really wet in the spring, very dry in the summer, which is a critical time period for these ducklings in terms of getting around brood ring for the, the parents and finding the resources to get to fledging stage. And then in the fall, we've been extremely wet again, where we're seeing these seven, 10 inch rainfalls that are happening in uh, late August, early September. Other threats to Wisconsin's waterfowl are predation. So things like uh, foxes, like raccoons, skunks in terms of nest predators. Also a ton of avian, uh, we, we don't tend to think about crows or things along those lines, crows and ravens as uh, impacts on nesting waterfowl, but we do see that happening across the landscape as well. Um, and then one of the new ones that we've been seeing for our partners on the east side of the, the country is potential genetic impacts. Um, for example, ballard populations in the Atlantic Flyway over on the east coast They've seen a pretty dramatic shift in their population downward, and some of that's being attributed to, you know, um, some of the hunting groups and hunting clubs on the East Coast. They release captive uh, mallards, so again, that's not native stock, and they're potentially breeding with wild mallards, and thus diluting that the genetic ability for these birds to adapt 
and then we're having poor uh, quality birds that are trying to survive and we're seeing the impact that they potentially can't make it. And we haven't, we haven't seen that so far. We've got some studies in the queue to look at that happening in the Great Lakes area, but that's something that uh, they're considered or very worried about on the east side of the uh, country. So just as uh, I'm gonna go over the top uh, breeding birds that we have breeding ducks, and then we have Canada geese in Wisconsin, how they're doing. Mallards, again, they're the most numerous breeding duck in North America and in Wisconsin, um, mainly because they're a habitat and foraging generalist. They'll take advantage of, you know, grassland, pristine grassland, but we've also seen them in, you know, flower potters and right in the middle of town or right up against buildings. So they tend to take advantage of whatever situation works best. General uh, medium-sized bird, two to three pounds. Uh, they can lay anywhere from one to 13 eggs. Um, and again, these are birds that if they lose that first nest, quite often they'll try to re-nest um, to take advantage of the conditions after that. As a reminder, they're precocial, young. So basically they come out of the egg and within an hour they're able to, to walk around, swim around. So it's not like some of our raptor uh, birds that you know the parents have to feed and get them to a stage months down the line where they're able to move around so and in Wisconsin we do put uh you know metal bands on these birds to track in terms of what their harvest are what their survival is um so we use these metal bands in Wisconsin we have one of the larger banding operations in the country and for mallards we do band roughly 3,000 a year to give you an idea of how their populations are looking um and again to put it into perspective our, we're right at just above our long-term average here in Wisconsin, which would be your, your left side graph, um, at about 180,000 birds. Um, that's what we count each spring when we get up and we fly and count their surveys. Um, put that into perspective, continentally, we're right around 9 million. So again, we have a, a very small population as compared to the entire continental population, but Generally, we're we're doing pretty good over the past 15, 10 to 15 years. Our population's been pretty stable, but continentally, they're doing extremely well. Blue-winged teal, one of our longest distant migrators that we have here in Wisconsin. I uh, just you know like to tell the story. We had a blue-winged teal that was banded down by Horicon in June, and it ended up being shot by a hunter in Argentina in the first week of September. So we know that these birds are long distance migrators, they tend to migrate extremely early. They're grassland nesting specialists, so they do need that high quality grassland adjacent to wetlands uh, in terms of the successful nesting. They forage primarily on aquatic inverts and vegetation. They are uh, quite small, you know, half the size or even more so than, than a mallard. Six to 14 eggs, again, precocial young. And um, one thing about uh, blue teal, which is, cool is that they do adjust their migration based on habitat conditions. So for example, you could have a blue-winged teal that nested here in Wisconsin, and if they came up in the springtime and saw that conditions weren't ideal, they could continue right on into Prairie Canada. And you know, they, they don't necessarily have to go back to the same exact spot, which is not necessarily the same thing for our warm -up. In Wisconsin, we have uh, seen a pretty steady decline in their population since the mid 70s. Um, and a lot of this we're attributing to the fact that they will adjust their migration. And we've been almost 25 years straight of really wet conditions on the US and Canadian prairies for, for really good conditions for breeding. So you can see how that's fluctuated over on the continental graph is you know, just a couple of years ago, we were at record highs for their population. They've kind of gone down a little bit the last couple of years, but again, really high numbers of blue teal continentally, and it seems that some of our birds have shifted out there. Wood ducks, an awesome success story. You know, back in the early 1900s, there were very few wood ducks continentally at all, and now they're, you know, one of our most numerous ducks here in Wisconsin. They're a cavity nester, so again, one of the few cavity nesting ducks that we have here in Wisconsin and that they'll, you know, they nest in trees and nest cavities and, you know, the duckling, as you can see in the picture there, they, once they're ready, they tend to jump out. Ideally, these cavities are overhanging water, so then they can jump right down in. They forage on seed, nuts, aquatic uh, insects, arthropods, and then again, if things get tough, they will switch to corn, they'll switch to grain and take advantage of that as well. Uh, just usually a little bit smaller than a mallard. Um, 
six to 16 eggs, and uh, they are what you would consider a nest dumper. So sometimes wood ducks, they'll uh, find a cavity that isn't theirs, and they'll you know it's another wood duck nest, and they'll drop their eggs in that nest and then fly away and let another wood duck take care of them. So they, they are uh, kind of notorious for doing that. So some will, some will make their own nest, but some will, uh, will let other ones do the work for them. Precocial young, as I said, and uh, again, one of the very few duck species that we have across North America that nest here in Wisconsin, as well as down in Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas. So again, they nest uh, from you know, as north in the United States to as far south in the United States, so long as they have the good conditions not requiring to be nesting up north to migrate. Wood ducks, because we don't have a continental estimate of them because it's tough to count them through the trees. Wisconsin, we try to do our best here. And you can see, you know, back in the 1970s, there were hardly any wood ducks at all here in Wisconsin. And we climbed pretty, all the way up into the early 2000s, we've seen the level out over the last 10 to 15 years on our wood ducks. And, you know, it's our number two breeding species right now in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, just again to point out continentally, um, Wisconsin, we have roughly 450,000 ducks uh, that we count each year. We peaked in the early 2000s, which was when we had the highest number of CRP, so grassland acres out in Wisconsin. We've kind of, we've lost about half a million acres of CRP since the early 2000s, and thus we've seen, you know, that impact to our breeding numbers. But Again, continentally, we're doing really, really well. You know, we're right at about 39, 40 million. Um, and, you know, Wisconsin is sitting at about 400,000. So in the grand scheme of things, we're about 1% of all of the ducks in all of North America. So, but here in Wisconsin, we, uh, we, we get, and we, they're very, people are interested in it. It's one of those things that we take advantage of each spring and each fall. Canada geese, uh, you either love them or you hate them. Um, they're another awesome success story, uh, bringing this, spe uh, this species back. So our giant Canada geese, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, there were hardly any giant Canada geese left in the country. And now um, we have a, oh, some would say an overabundance of giant Canada geese. We have three different groups. We have these giant Canada geese and these Ontario nesting Canada geese. Genetically, they're the same. However, our giant Canada geese tend to be larger in size, whereas the, the birds that migrate from Ontario and the subarctic, they tend to be smaller in size because they do have to make those long distance flights, whereas some of our giant birds tend to, they can get pretty big because they're only flying a couple hundred miles. And then another genetically different one would be a cackling goose. So that's a, a Canada goose essentially that looks about, about the size of a mallard, maybe just a hair bigger than a mallard, but they make these massive migrations from the Canadian Arctic. Forage on grasses and grains, anywhere from six to 18 pounds. So again, you can see that huge variation in size. Uh, two to eight eggs, and these are ones that uh, they, they may re-nest if possible, um, and they're extremely hardy and adaptable. So as, as I said, the, you can see these birds in just about every county in Wisconsin, at every park, every golf course, you know, and then in the really good habitats like Horicon, Crex, and Navarino. So. Um, Wisconsin, you can see we've had a pretty, you know, long steady uh, increase in their numbers. Um, there's that spike that happened in the early 2000s that I don't know is actually real. But uh, yeah, we have uh, been pretty high the last couple of years. And then continentally, our giant Canada goose population keeps going up and up and up to near 1.5 million birds across the Mississippi Flyway. So what about Wisconsin and wetlands? Um, we have a plethora. We have 15,000 lakes. We got over 5 million acres of wetlands. You figure we got Lake Superior on our north, Lake Michigan on our east, the Wisconsin River going through the middle of it, the Mississippi River on the west. Um, we have these, you know, Horicon Marsh is the largest cattail marsh this side of the Mississippi River, Crex Meadows, Navarino. We have just thousands of need. We have these wildlife areas that are specifically for wetlands, and we got thousands and thousands of acres across Wisconsin that are managed primarily for this. And the nice thing is, is our public trust doctrine um, basically defines any navigable waterway as public land. So that means it makes it extremely tough for these navigable waterways to ever be altered or, you know, 
filled in or things. There's a lot of permitting. There's a lot of process to get through that. So again, really good foresight on our, our forebears to put Wisconsin's water in the public trust doctrine. So just to give you guys an idea of how things have shaken out in terms of wetland numbers that we count on our spring water fall survey. So this is just an idea of we fly. I fly the northern half of the state. My counterparts fly the southern half of the state. And all those red lines are transects that we cover uh, across the state and we estimate wetlands. So I guess it's a pretty busy slide, but just to give you an idea, we have nonlinear wetlands, which are, you know, ponds and lakes and uh, areas like fields, like skim water, stuff like that. Those are in the blue. And then the red are like our rivers and our streams. And you can see that particularly in the southern part of the state, the two right graphs, we've been pretty wet the last couple of years. Um, and then our north, we've We've been, you know, a little bit high, I would say, uh, but right around where we've been average, which is not not necessarily surprising as our boreal, you know, in our in that transition, the northern part of Wisconsin tends to be considerably more stable than in the southern half of the state. But um, kind of to touch base on what are the effects of climate change and the impact on water fluctuations in waterfall here in Wisconsin, um, just the impact of of on weather, seeing these these massive uh, these cyclings that are either extremes on one end, extreme water conditions, we're getting a lot of rain, and all of a sudden we see flash flooding, or we go for you know a month and a half or two months, and we have less than two or three inches of rain. So with this dramatic variation throughout the annual cycle, we see some negative impacts and some positive impacts. Uh, like I said, when we see you know these five, seven, eight-inch rainfall events, especially during the springtime, we lose a lot of nesting effort, nesting habitat. These birds, you, know, you can see like that Canada goose there. They've already established their nest, and that nest is going to be lost because they can't they can't maintain those nesting efforts when when it's flooded like that. Uh, also, if you know we get all that rain and then we're able, the birds that are able to make it, they get to June or July and then all, they haven't seen rain for two months. The wetlands that they had identified to bring their brood to, to feed them, to get them to a stage for fledging, there's no water, it's all drying up, and then they're having to trek across, trek across dry land to try and find other things. That's when our predators tend to find them or pick them off. So again, these these extreme periods have a pretty substantial effect on those birds. However, there are some uh, potential positive impacts. For example, what we're seeing right now on the east side of the state, like Green Bay uh, has, you know, at all time records in terms of water levels, those water levels are flowing into uh, forests and stuff adjacent to our, adjacent to Green Bay. And we're seeing some pretty significant die-offs of trees, which then create potential nice cavity areas for, say, wood ducks and our other cavity nesting population. So, so there's some impact to that, as well as in the fall. Um, uh, if we have a ton of rain, it tends to allow these birds to uh, spread out going into the hunting season. It's not necessarily ideal for hunters because there's water, water everywhere, and the ducks don't have to go where people normally think about it. But it works really well for ducks because they can take advantage of habitat that was not necessarily available to them throughout the entire year. But then when it comes to the fall, when they're getting ready to make these big migrations, there's flooded forest everywhere, there's flooded agricultural fields everywhere that they can take advantage of the food resources before they make their big push. So just wanted to kind of touch base on some of these extreme conditions. Like I said, uh, Green Bay and Lake Michigan, um, I remember when I started with the DNR um, in 2013, they said Green Bay was at one of its all-time lows in terms of the water level. And this last August, it was nearly three feet above their normal August water levels. So again, you figure that they've raised three feet, the amount of water that it takes to raise all of Green Bay that much higher is, is significant. And that does have impacts to adjacent habitat next to uh, Green Bay and Lake Michigan. Similarly, uh, say we've had these five plus rainfall events along the Mississippi River that have resulted in huge changes in the dynamics of the Mississippi River. Those islands that we have out there, they, they've been working on awesome habitat projects. It just alters the entire landscape when you see that type of water come flooding through the upper Mississippi River, um, and again, has impacts for both the spring and the fall. And like I said, especially on the Mississippi River for our staging conditions, if, if things change dramatically annually, it's, it has a pretty substantial impact. And you can see on that graph, 
on the right, these are uh, this extreme precipitation index. And you can see since the early 1900s to right around now, we continue to see that extreme precipitation index climb and climb and climb. So this is not something that's not going to go away. We're gonna to continue to see this. So what about impacts uh, and change in climate for waterfowl, um, climate change? So again, this my, the left figure here just shows you know, the variation in average uh, winter uh, temperature and how that's going to change. And you know, the, the north appears to be seeing some of our more significant uh, temperature fluctuations in the, the, the far north and the far south. And what that's going to do is it's going to impact whether or not these birds uh, are going to migrate as far as well as is it going to down the road change the land and the landscape because then what will be available in terms of grassland is, is going to be able to have enough precipitation to hold on to what was traditionally ideal nesting habitat. Um, the other graph that I have on here uh, is showing projections of how uh, changes in our climate scenario will impact you know, this suite of 12 or 13 species that we've identified here. And you can see things like mallards and wood ducks uh, appear to be you know, gonna be doing pretty well throughout the, throughout the situation, just because again, they, they tend to be, uh, again, mallards being habitat generalists, they'll take advantage of whatever and wood ducks, we are at least in Wisconsin right now, we're as forested now as we were since we uh, first started cutting down trees here in Wisconsin. So again, our, our habitat works pretty good right now for wood ducks. And it looks like uh, that's going to be a continuing trend into the future. But some of our other species you can see are starting to, uh, they're going to be looking at significant abundance declines uh, that will be happening under these, these scenarios. So there is a real concern that's happening at our flyway level of what does climate change mean? And, you know, a big one is where we send a lot of our money in terms of habitat and where we're putting a lot of good work on the ground. We have to make sure that we're not throwing money in an area that birds are no longer going to utilize. So just again, to give you guys an idea, these are uh, what going from blue to red, red being we're gonna see more birds in those areas in the future. Uh, for black ducks, you see that there's a definitely a, a northward shift for which, and there's a northward shift just again, recognizing that if uh, the conditions are going to, we're gonna be in a warmer climate, those birds will have to continually moving northward to stay at what was status quo for them. Um, so all across, basically every species that uh, that they're looking at, we're seeing this uh, this northward shift in these in these numbers of these birds, whether it's redheads, it's ringnecks, it's mallards, it's scop, it's pintail. We're we're seeing continentally that we're projecting that these birds are going to have to be moving farther northward to. Uh, take advantage of said conditions, but the idea is, is, is there habitat in those northward areas that uh, is available for these birds? So hopefully, you know, as much as they may want to shift northward, if they don't have the habitat to sustain these nesting efforts, we're going to see significant declines in their numbers. And again, just to point out, you know, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, the Canadian prairies where, you know, 75, 80, 90% of our, uh, most of the ducks that breed in North America happen in those areas. We're seeing a pretty substantial shift in temperature projected with not as much change in precipitation. So again, you're seeing that relatively our precipitation isn't gonna change to the same level that we're looking at changes in terms of temperature. Thus, we're looking at drier summers. We're looking at significantly drier winters. Um, and we're gonna need, having drier winters means less snowpack and less water available on, the, on those nesting areas for those waterfowl. Similar situation here in Wisconsin. Um, you see that we're looking at, you know, anywhere from a six to, or five and a half to six degree increase in uh, temperatures moving into the future with, you know, say only an inch and a half uh, increase in terms of precipitation. So it's, it's one of those ones that we're, we're going to be experiencing warmer conditions with less, potentially less water, or I mean with, you know, maybe a little bit more water, but when we see those extreme uh, events of precipitation, it's not, you know, drawn out throughout the entire growing season. It's just happening in five inches here, seven inches here, and then long periods of dry. 
So uh, what can we do as uh, citizens to help Wisconsin's waterfowl? You know, the big one in terms of climate change is tough. You know, as you and me, we want to do something is, you know, reduce our carbon footprint, you know, the best ways that we can do possible. But again, also you know, supporting folks that are trying to make a difference in terms of how we go about uh, improving uh, our environmental conditions. Other ways, uh, buying a duck stamp. So, you know, there's a state duck stamp here where one third of that state, the funding from that state duck stamp goes to Prairie Canada because again, you know, we're only 1% of the continent population of waterfowl. And then two thirds of it stays right here in Wisconsin to specifically help both public and private wetlands uh, to improve it for waterfowl. Get out and volunteer, just reach out. If any of you out there would like to be part of something, please let me know. We have adopt a wildlife areas where we let people get out there and work on habitat projects. Um, so please reach out. eBird and citizen science. This is one that uh, the waterfowl professionals are using uh, significantly more because there's so many people out there that are you know, observing these birds, going back into the computer, bringing it right up on their phone and saying, hey, this is where I saw a ringneck or this is where I saw a canvas back. And we're using that information now to help uh, manage these populations because the amount of data being collected is so much more than just say myself or Dr. Sedinger could pull together. Help with nest boxes, hen houses, and natural habitat. So again, I mean, for wood ducks, you know, they're doing really good here in Wisconsin, but it's always one of those awesome ways to introduce people to waterfowl management and uh, just get out and you could build some wood duck boxes, you take care of those, make it an annual thing, go and clean them out. Uh, hen houses are also, I have a picture of it right there, that's becoming a newer thing too. Basically putting a post with uh, nesting material out in the middle of a wetland. So then, you know, it makes it much more difficult for predators to get out there and uh, depredate that nest. So again, those are awesome ways. And just any way that you can um, improve in the habitat that say maybe you manage or, you know, that you, you know people that have, just anything that you can do is awesome. Um, don't feed ducks and geese. as as nice as it is to see those ducks at the park or those geese at the park, you can see that bottom right hand picture. That's Canada goose with angel wing because it's been fed uh, bread, which has essentially no nutritional value whatsoever. And uh, that, that goose has uh, suffered because of that. You know, it's a, it's a food resource that they like, but it provides nothing to them. And you can see that there are these physical deformities that come with it. So as, as cool as it is to go out there and, and do that, let, let these birds be wild and let it figure it out themselves. And I get, like I said, reach out to myself, reach out, I mean, to Dr. Sender, reach out to your federal biologist. We are always looking for help one way or another to do this because trying to manage, you know, 40 million waterfowl across three different countries here in North America is, is an almost impossible task for one person in each state to do. So if you folks would like to come out and reach out, please let me know. And with that, any questions from folks? That was great. Uh, thanks a lot, Taylor. And I just wanted to remind folks that uh, if you are having some technical difficulties, it sounds like there maybe are some people having some internet uh, troubles that all these talks are being recorded and so you will be able to view, uh, view them after the fact. And if you do have any questions, um, Now's your chance to drop them in the, the Q&A box there. We do have one I see, uh, Taylor. So how does the Audubon Society work to help these efforts? So the Audubon Society in the past has uh, definitely submitted uh, projects for our duck stamp. So they reached out to and said, hey, we have this funding, this funding source that comes from our duck stamp. And if they have projects identified that they would like to, okay, we got this wetland or we got 30 acres that we'd like to improve, we'd, they'd submit their project and we'd rank that along with all of the other projects that we get throughout the state. So through that, and as well as uh, eBird and Citizen Science, the Audubon Society really works really well with that and gets a lot of information out with folks. They provide a ton of internships for professionals across the country for people to get out to do this. So they, they do do good work. Got another one here for you. Uh, okay. This one piques my interest as a fellow uh, person who's interested in wood ducks. Uh, so 
we had some wood ducks stop through last spring. We're on a forested four acres on the edge of suburbs and farmland and don't have much open water nearby. Is it worth putting up boxes or are they unlikely to inhabit those boxes? If there if there isn't water, I would, you know, really close to it, it would be pretty tough. You know, that those wood ducks would likely not take advantage of, of those nesting cavities if there isn't water. I mean, and again, it doesn't have to be a lot. You know, a lot of these are right along streams and rivers and stuff. So long as that they have moving water to get to larger bodies of water, they'll take advantage of that. But if you don't have anything that you think is going to sustain water throughout the entire year that's close to this area, it's it's likely not going to be very successful. And then we've got one more. So uh, where would be the best place to call if interested in putting in some wetland scrapes on a property? So in terms, if it's your private property, uh, the best resource that I would reach out to, and again, if you're looking, if you're looking for money, you know, to help get the job done, you could reach out to Wisconsin Waterfall Association because they do typically work with their private land management, private land biologists, they ask for money from our state duck stamp to work on those private lands. But if you're looking for just help in terms of how to do it or what's the best area to do or what's, you know, if we want to put in some, you know, moist soil grasses or moist soil stuff like that, you can just reach out to me or Jason Fleener, who's our waterfowl or our wetland specialist with the Wisconsin DNR. And we have a ton of resources for people uh, to look at. So, all right, let's just see here. I think um, I think that's all we've got. So, thanks a lot, Taylor. And um, with that, I think we're going to break for lunch, and then we've got uh, one more talk lined up for after lunch. So, um, it's been a great morning, and uh, thanks for coming. And Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see you, Taylor, and we'll see everybody else back uh, shortly here after lunch.